Hello, welcome to another episode of Bring Your Own Grief. I'm your host, Arglen Kelly. Have you just experienced the devastating loss of a loved one and now facing that dreaded return to work? Have you already returned to work after your loss, but you're, you're struggling to survive, to, to get by with all that's going through your mind, all that's going through your heart? Well, you certainly don't want to miss this episode. Taking your grief to work, returning to the job after the loss of a loved one. Why was she like that? She wanted coffee. She wanted coffee. <laughs> she wanted coffee. <laughs> right? I didn't know. I didn't want coffee. I was good. <laughs> Why didn't she say, I want coffee? Hey, and if you're uh, an employer, a business leader, owner, or manager who happened to stumble upon this episode, you might want to stick around and see grief from the perspective of your bereaved employees. And listen, for my fellow grievers, even if it's been years since your unfortunate loss, you still don't want to miss this one. Any little nugget we can find on our grief journey, regardless of how far along we are, is just pure gold, isn't it? As a bereaved father myself, I'm also a member of this club we absolutely didn't ask to join, didn't want to join, but there it is. And I want to tell each of you that I'm very sorry for your loss, as I know you are of mine. We've been through the same fire, right? A fire we wouldn't wish on our worst enemies. And I'm honored you chose to be here to walk down a path towards hope and healing with me. Now, as for healing, we will never completely heal. We know that but there will be healing. And together, we can and will find peace and purpose in our lives ahead. For just a moment, I wanna take the time to thank you for tuning in to the Bring Your Own Grief Network. If you haven't yet, please make sure you subscribe to the BYOG YouTube channel. And if you find value in this episode, like it on YouTube and share it with others who are going down the same path of hope and healing as you and I. Liking and sharing these episodes makes them so much easier for our brothers and sisters in grief to find them in a search. So thank you. Now, let's get into taking your grief to work, shall we? We all grieve in our own unique and individual way, just as we all have unique and individual work environments, don't we? So we really can't drill down to specific workplaces or even professions here. But there'll be a great deal here that I'm sure will provide some helpful insight to all. And yes, I know I, I do my fair share of episodes on male grief alone, but this one, though, is for all of us, men and women. So welcome to all. Taking our grief to work with us can be rough. Our world has changed with our loss. We, we might have to move forward to a new normal or a life without our loved one. And as hard as that is, we will do that. And together, when needed, but we will move forward. For most of us, though, we can't move forward without our jobs. As much as I wish, most of us aren't independently wealthy, are we? And look, we all know how cold that some employers can seem when it comes to handling an employee's loss. Certainly not all of them, but, but far too many. One thing that, that hits us all is how long before we have to return to work. Now, sadly, in today's companies, the average number of days allowed for paid bereavement leave across America is what? <laughs> Only three. That's it, three days on average, and that's for an immediate family member. Some companies give more, some less, some not at all. No paid days off. Maybe you get three days off, but with no pay. Regardless, three days remains the national average, and that simply is not enough time to get your head and heart wrapped around the loss of a loved one, is it? If we look at it from the view of a working mother, she can take plenty of time off before and after the birth of her blessed child per the FMLA or Family Medical Leave Act. And should, really, that, that's an important time bringing a child into the world. But how is it she can only have three days off if, heaven forbid, she loses that child? Are you kidding me? How, how is that right? But the number of days of paid leave, paid bereavement leave, if any is given at all, is solely at the discretion of the business owners we work for. Admittedly, I was, I was pretty fortunate, very fortunate actually. The company I was working for when I lost my son didn't even consider my time off as an issue. I was a salaried senior employee and told to take as much time as I needed. The term bereavement leave never came up. 
I was out a couple of weeks and never missed a dime, nor was anything categorized on my pay stub as bereavement leave. You, however, could be in a job where your employer gives you the standard and customary three paid days of bereavement leave, and that's it. Another company might allow employees their, their three paid days plus any unused paid vacation time earned but not taken yet. Yet another might do the same, but, but also tell you to take as much unpaid leave as you need. Now, that's fantastic. Take as much as you need. It happens and, and it's much appreciated, I'm sure. But how much time, unpaid time off, can any of us afford to take? We have bills due, financial responsibilities. We can't take a whole lot of free time, can we? Now, normally if you're working for a mid to large size company, your bereavement leave is dictated in your company policies and you'll, you'll get very little, if any, flexibility. And no offense to the company, it's not really their fault. But frankly, we live in a very litigious world now, don't we? If one employee is granted more requested time off than another for, say, bereavement leave, whether paid or unpaid, that opens a company up to complaints and lawsuits for, for discrimination. Why did he get six days off when he lost his mother, but you only allowed me four when I lost mine? You're treating him better than me because I'm different in some way, right? It's just easier and safer for a company to establish set policy and have everyone stick to it. it no exceptions. Keeps them out of court, right? I, I certainly understand that. But you got to know that the U.S. Department of Labor doesn't require or mandate time off for employees at all. Not paid vacations, not paid holidays, not paid bereavement leave, and believe it or not, not even lunch. Try telling someone they're not entitled by law to a lunch break, though. They'll tell you that you're wrong or that you're out of your mind. But trust me, the only thing the Department of Labor really mandates is that employees receive a paid 15-minute break for every four hours worked. That's it. Okay, that and maybe some required time off issues under you know, workers' comp and FMLA. Any paid time off is solely at the discretion of the employer, basically because it comes directly out of the employer's pocket. Minimum wages, overtime, pay while you are working is certainly covered by DOL. But what a company pays when you are not being productive, not at the work site, is not mandated or regulated by laws. On bereavement leave, though, gratefully, there are ongoing congressional attempts to get bereavement leave included within the FMLA. It's been going on for a while. It's, it's been kicked back a few times, but it is a bipartisan effort with some Republicans and some Democrats on board. So let's hope it goes the next time around and we can get a bill signed. I certainly consider myself a staunch advocate of that effort. Now, that said, you're probably going to be returning to work well before you're ready with grief so heavy in your heart. And it'll be a while before the effects on you, how you function, start to lessen somewhat. If you're just getting back to work or getting ready to start back, <laughs> it might not seem like it, but it will get easier to function day to day. I know this. I've been there. I've actually been on both sides of the fence as a newly bereaved father returning to work and as a business leader. See, way back before my loss, I started my adult life like, you know, like many young children wanted to do. I tried to run away to join the circus, but sadly, the circus turned me down. So instead, I joined the United States Marine Corps, became a military policeman, and after four honorable years, went out in the civilian world and began my career in law enforcement, which I enjoyed throughout the majority of my life. But when that fun was over, I spent another 15 years in executive positions within the defense and security industry. Private businesses managing thousands of employees across the country and around the world. I had the honor not only of overseeing manpower in the operations of these companies, but also overseeing human resources and financial departments for over a decade and a half. Now, I am a bereaved father first and foremost, so I, I want to start by talking about what you could be facing on your return or what you're going to go through when you're back on the job. Afterwards, I ask you to stick around. I'm going to give you the insight from the business side and how grief in the workplace is currently handled. For now, though, let's talk about us. Let's talk about returning to work, functioning with grief. Now, have you ever heard this quote? When you come to work, leave your personal life at the door. Right. We don't come to work different people than we are at home, do we? 
even before your loss you went to work each day carrying with you all the emotions and motivations and demotivations that were going on in your life it's what makes you you and primarily drives who you are at work as well it's human nature unless you're an actor you are you all the time and now however you are you except you carry with you the unfortunate burden of grief and loss so listen the very first thing you must do be easy on yourself you have a lot on your mind expect to be far more distracted and less productive for some time to come something else and this isn't always going to be easy for you but before you return to work you really should have your boss or someone you feel is appropriate talk to your co-workers about your loss I know some of them may have attended the services and already know what happened but others not in your tighter circle may know little or nothing of what happened even if some folks at work are not social friends outside of the job you probably spend more awake time with them than you do with those at home and they have some personal concern for you if they aren't filled in before you come back you'll find yourself being asked over and over about what happened you don't want to go through that it can really be emotionally draining and speaking of that don't ever go beyond your comfort level if those questions come and you don't want to tell your story over and over again politely say you would rather not talk about it now that's all and here's another thing as you begin to move forward through your grief you still need to be aware that your mind and your reflexes your responses and thoughts may not be as sharp as they were before at any time if you're feeling tired beat overwhelmed or unfocused let your boss or team member know you might need a little time to complete your tasks don't resume anything until you're sure you can do it safely and with total confidence in your abilities I want to tell you that, that accidents and injuries on the job increase exponentially right after our loss and when you return to work you want to get together with your leadership and let them know how you're doing even if you're the boss do it as often as you need to things have to get done I know but the company goals and missions are about more than just one person more than just you and some jobs can be dangerous or have sensitive consequences you are a valuable asset to the company and the updates you give will simply allow others to move resources around as needed and something else here particularly for us guys be very cautious with your ego and maybe some of our other manly traits inside too but ego mostly it's, it's what I mean the most here it'll probably pop out some it'll make an appearance or two along the way especially around those who look to you for leadership those manly instincts might tell you to appear strong unshakable and someone who bounces back from adversity quickly you just remind your ego that the loss of a loved one is much more than any difficulty found in the workplace listen I know it's tough to imagine at times but you will be back to you again now not the old you but you with the same abilities and drives it just takes time and patience on another front speaking of patience you'll have to be patient with well-wishers at two well-wishers at work it goes back to understanding that those at work will be uncomfortable in your loss they won't be sure how to interact with you they're, they're going to be awkward and say stupid stuff bet on it when they do try to remember they mean no malice they don't mean to be insensitive they, they want to be supportive want to comfort you by saying something but have no idea what to say whatever may come out could make you cringe or want to pop them in the forehead again just try to be patient with them please some may say nothing at all on top of feeling awkward they're, they're not comfortable with mortality it puts them right in your shoes doesn't it to recognize your loss makes them think what if that happens to me in my case I lost a child many on my staff had children and the what if is something they, they just can't handle they want to avoid it does that make sense speaking of avoiding don't be surprised to notice out of the corner of your eye where they think you can't see them co-workers cross a hallway or even a shop floor to avoid making contact with you again they're uncomfortable patience please 
and if there is actually another employee around who's lost a loved one as well as you, your loss might bring back incredible pain for them, which they can't or they don't want to deal with at the moment. You can't know their grief journey, can't know where they are in their healing, but I'm sure at some point in the future, you'll be supporting each other, trust me. You know, that said, you should know that if there is some poor soul that is grieving a loss and he is healing well, it would be rare if they avoided you. Now, they might know to give you some space for a time, but that's just for now. They're not going to avoid you altogether or treat you differently than before your loss. They've been through the fire. They belong to this club we didn't want to join. Another thought for you. Even as you move through your grief journey, those at work, even the closer ones, can be way ahead of you in healing from your loss. Sounds like an odd thing to say, huh? What do I mean by that? Close co-workers, especially those close to you, also experience grief pains when you had your loss. They care for you. But they don't go home every night to a different world like you and I. Their life has not changed, and they don't live with a minute-by-minute thoughts of grief just marinating in their hearts and minds. Sadly, it won't be long before your loss is not on their mind quite as much as it is on yours, if at all, unless you bring it up. And more on that. You are the one putting on the brave face, right? It might be fake, but to them, it's real. They want it to be real. They are happy believing you are getting over it. They just don't understand you never will. Unless they've been through the fire, they have no idea what you're going through. Bottom line, don't be surprised if, in a short time, your loss is a distant thought to others around you, while it's still foremost in your thoughts. That includes those over you, under you, and working with you. Now, on the plus side, when you're at that point others think you're getting over it, that may mean you're at a stage where you can actually spend some short periods of time without the loss weaving through every fiber of your brain. Only short times though, but that's okay for now. We'll take it. And what others won't be able to see even further along your healing is that the emotions of grief comes in waves. When those waves come, they'll demand your immediate attention, regardless of where you are or what you are doing. Those that have never experienced a traumatic loss simply don't understand that. To them, you had the loss, felt the pain, moved on, and, and got back to who you were before the loss. Now, when you have those times when the waves come, don't be surprised if some, including your bosses, wonder why you aren't over it. Why are you moving backwards in your mind? You need to let these leaders at work know that grief from your loss, your loss of a loved one, does not simply just go away. Don't be embarrassed by that. There's much at stake here. Tactfully inform them that there may be times now and even in the future when you will need some considerations. That might mean an occasional unscheduled day off or time to take a break for a walk or just a, a few minutes of quiet privacy someplace. Any considerations you discuss up front should actually increase your value to the business, not the opposite. And you really don't want to work for some place where you aren't considered a value to the company, do you? Now, I know it. This is easier than it's easier to say than it is to do. I know, but frankly, if there is no understanding for your bereavement, your needs, then you really should consider seeking another employer. <laughs> you might not be in a position to do that now, but you'll need considerations from time to time. You'll need that because your grief is going to continue in waves and will for some time into the future. Even as you move forward in healing and the pain lessens some, the pain, the grief, will still come to you in those waves. And you don't want them impacting you or others on the job in any harmful way. While you might be concerned what others at work, including your bosses, might think of you, you need to be more concerned with thoughts of healing and safety for yourself and others. Now, speaking of healing, here's a big one. Don't use work as a complete distraction from grief. Some folks who've recently lost a loved one might actually look, well, they might look forward to going back to work. But this could be a mind game. See, the mind wants to return to healthy. Being healthy is a natural state for the mind as well as the body. You know, like the way the body heals itself from a cut or an injury, the mind wants to heal itself as well. And it may try to find healthy means by seeking normal and returning to work, hoping to shut down at least some of the pain. 
This is actually known as what's called the normalcy bias. See, when something traumatic happens, the, the mind wants to protect you, keep you from the intense shock and pain by invoking something normal and removing the traumatic pain. This could be pain to the body or to the mind. Think about severe injuries, combat accident victims who had a limb severed. The brain shuts down the pain for many, doesn't it? They report having no idea the traumatic loss at first, and even looking at the missing appendage, pain may not come for some time. That's somewhat similar to the normalcy bias after our loss. You aren't going to block the pains out completely from grief, but your mind is going to long for something, anything normal ease the pains. And what is more normal for many of us than returning to work? <laughs> also, weren't there some very kind people who lectured us right after our loss, especially during the services, the ones who said, you take care of yourself over and over and over. Well, guess what? Sometimes taking care might mean you convince yourself to stay busy and remain active. And all that does really is, is make you falsely believe that getting up and getting back to work ASAP and putting all your efforts into that is the right thing to do, right? You might also think that work can occupy your mind. The concentration and focus will push the pain aside. Time does not heal all wounds, my friend, not grief anyway. It will lessen, but never completely heal. So if you dive headfirst into your job, hoping beyond hope that the distraction will fade the pain, you're just slowing the healing process. Truth, and we all go by truth here at the BYOG, is that it'll be some time before you can work without those grief emotions invading your thoughts. The power of grief does not wane or lessen each time you push it away. That painful emotion you pushed aside can actually become more intense and push itself back out again, this time more overwhelming, forcing you to give it your full attention regardless of where you are or what you're doing. Will that be why you're doing something hazardous at work? Something dangerous? Perhaps. Remember, those workplace accidents and injuries increase exponentially for the early bereaved. And throwing yourself back to work may not just be a means to distract yourself from pain either. It may also be an attempt at returning some sense of control to your life. See, when you lose a loved one, especially for us ego-controlled men, it was probably out of our control something we had no say-so over at all. And we don't handle that well. Men are systemizers, organizers, controllers. It's in our DNA. But your job, what you do at work, is something you're probably pretty good at, regardless of your position. That means you have control over your performance. Be cautious you don't use that control you hold at work to replace the control you felt you lost with the passing of your loved one. And listen, if you find yourself working longer hours than usual, taking fewer breaks, and generally becoming you know, a workaholic, just know this isn't a healthy way for healing. It's worth repeating that the pains of grief need to be faced to move forward. Don't allow yourself to be delayed. Take the time to prepare yourself to return to work. Take the time to feel your pains. You are a value and an asset to yourself first and foremost. Your job, your company, considers you an asset as well, I'm sure. If not, again, when the time is right, try to find one that believes that you are. My bet, though, is your job is far more understanding than you may imagine. Let them know what you're going through and, and what you'll need. You spend a lot of time there. Interact with others who care about you. It was a safe place for you before the loss. A home away from home for many. It can be that again in time. Be careful returning to work. Be easy on yourself. So now, I want to talk about the business side of things for just a bit, and I want to thank you for sticking around for that. <clears throat> I don't want you to, to, to think for a minute I'm siding with an employer when I talk about this. Again, I'm a bereaved father first and foremost, but if you've listened to me before, hopefully continue to listen to this and my other grief support episodes, or maybe even consider attending my future conferences or workshops to hear me talk, you'll know that I believe, above all else, that when it comes to healing and moving forward, awareness and understanding are a key to doing just that. I like being able to offer awareness and understanding of all sides. Again, I've been on both sides. Employer and grieving employee returning to work after the loss of my son and trying 
to function at my job. So I bring the side of the business leader too, raw and truthful. The truth, even when raw, is something we must always, always give each other as fellow travelers. It keeps us on the path of healing, right? So again, nothing against any businesses out there, but here are the cold hard facts I'm laying out for my fellow bereaved. A business is in the business of what? Making money, right? That's why the business started in the first place. Rarely have I heard of a company being started as a hobby, although I'm sure it's been done. And I highly doubt that anyone ever sat down, scratched their head, said to themselves, I want to open a business and, and not make any money. What if you and I knew each other, respected each other's talents in a particular field, and one day I happened to walk up and ask if you wanted to start a company with me and take a loss. Maybe we can take big risks, take out big loans, mortgage our homes maybe, and plan on taking a loss. Sound like a plan? Well, I think you can just probably walk away, right? Businesses don't operate to take a loss regardless of size, small, mid-size, or big business. There's just too much riding on it at every level. In the vast majority of those businesses, our employers are small and mid-size entities. And over my years, in my own businesses that I've worked for, I've subcontracted a number of small and mid-sized companies to work with us and became friends with the owners. And I've met my share of owners who went home every Friday with less money in their pocket, profit, really, than the lowest paid employee on their payroll. Heck, just making payroll for all their employees on a Friday might mean there's nothing left to take home at all. Profits can really be thin and working funds can really be tight for small and mid-sized companies. But given a lot of risk, hard work, the right people in a few years, these business owners hope to be in a lot better shape, just like you and I do in our careers and in our grief journeys. That said, moving on, it's pretty simple actually. For profit businesses are, well, profit driven. And profit comes from what? Profit comes from productivity. And productivity comes from boots on the ground. Employees on the job producing the product or performing the services a business has promised, sold, or offered to be sold to someone else, right? Any reduction in boots on the ground generally means what? A drop in productivity, and yes, then a drop in profits. <clears throat> Excuse me. When we look at big businesses out there, say the Fortune 500, we do find some strong employee morale and welfare programs coming about, thankfully. They understand now that employees are really their largest cost, not just in payroll, but in, in turnover, workers' comp, and, and other similar areas. In order to reduce that, it takes proper care and feeding of the employee to keep them around longer and keep them working at high levels, peak proficiency. Now, I love analogies, so stick with me for a sec, please. As a, as a woodworking hobbyist, it's incredibly similar to me. One tool I use in my workshop, my workshop jobs, if you will, is a handsaw, right? I use it, I abuse it, I let it get dull, I throw it aside, eventually throw it away and go buy a new one. <laughs> I want to get back to getting the most I can for my money, or so I thought. It took my father, a business owner and auto mechanic, to teach me about tools and managing people at the same time after I complained about my saw. <laughs> he told me simply that any tool, including my saw, would last a lifetime if I just took just a few minutes of care with it, sharpened it from time to time, oiled it down when I was through using it. Don't let it get rusty and worn out. Spend some time giving it attention, right? If I spent that little bit of time, he told me I'd save a lot of money on buying new tools. It's funny how things cross over. It, it's no different than employees for me. And I'm, I'm not, I gotta ask you, do you really think I'm trying to equate employees to tools? Yeah, actually I am. I don't wanna seem insensitive. Business owners start a business and usually need to find tools, right? Most times, those tools are people. People to help them produce and fulfill products and services. Employees are the tools. The work is not always easy. We can get dull, worn out, tired if not properly cared for. Some businesses we get thrown away and they bring on other tools to take our place. But owners, leaders, and Business executives are learning that a little investment in the tools, the employees up front, actually saves so much more profit than just chucking away an old tool and buying a new one. It just pays to take care of your tools, your people, 
Thankfully, there is a huge wave over the last couple of decades in which big businesses are becoming more employee friendly. This helps give the company a great reputation as employer, a place where you want to go to work. It attracts good candidates and keeps them around much longer, right? There's no denying and it saves the company an incredible amount of money and is it's great for you and I as employees. But those morale and welfare programs cost upfront money, don't they? You have to spend a little to save sometimes, a few minutes sharpening the tools, the cost of a little oil to wipe them down. You get the picture, right? And unfortunately, small and mid-sized businesses often have little available time and money to spend on the upfront front end. Not yet, anyway, at least not until they grow larger. But there's a double-edged sword, right? Company morale and welfare programs would allow for faster growth, but can't be afforded just yet, hopefully soon. Now, that's not to say small and mid-sized businesses don't treat employees well. They do. I've, I've witnessed a great many that do. It's just more difficult to consider seeing some of the fringe benefits that you'll find in the major corporations. But when it comes to the bereaved employees, speaking of the major corporations, we still don't have much difference between the larger companies and the mom and pops either. Not when it comes to bereavement care. Even with all the wonderful health programs and morale and welfare offerings, grief is just something seldom thought of. Some are getting better and I applaud them. I actually work with a Fortune 50 company to help provide very compassionate support to grieving employees. I also do management uh, coaching and, and workshops for companies to teach them how to handle the bereaved employee on their return to work. It's a huge problem, not only for we grievers, but for the bottom line of the business. They just never realized it in the past. That's why it's called a hidden loss to the business. They had no idea before they were losing money through grief. Now, let me elaborate on that just a bit. I'm going to tell you about a study done by the Grief Recovery Institute of Sherman Oaks, California. Over several years, the Institute interviewed over 10,000 individuals who had experienced the death of a loved one and were also employed when the loss took place. The interviews focused on the impacts of grief on their work performance. You know, as a result of this study, widely accepted because of the sampling and measuring metrics that they used, the Institute determined that businesses across America are losing an astonishing $75.1 billion in annual revenue. Annual. That's $75.1 billion each and every year, all due to grief impacts in the workplace. And guess what? That study was done in the year 2003. That was a long time ago now, right? Has anything changed since 2003? I certainly don't know of any increase in grief support in the workplace. Do you? One thing has changed, however, inflation. In today's dollars, if you factor in inflation, that $75.1 billion in loss is actually over $100 billion annually losses annually to American businesses. That comes through lost productivity, prolonged absences, increased accidents and injuries, and many other performance-based factors. Now, you'll have your own story, I'm sure, but I'll give you mine. Before I lost my son, I served as a director in a good-sized company with over 20 managers directly reporting to me. I loved that job and I loved my title. I took it literally. I just directed. I was a director. You go here and do this. You go there and do that. It was, it was nice. My mornings usually consisted of many of those managers casually stopping by my door just to say good morning. I got used to it over the years. Sat back and sipped coffee as one by one they stopped by and in casual talk they would tell me what they had planned for the day. Now, some plans were great and we agreed on them and other plans needed some adjusting. That's why it was so nice. I loved being a director. I just directed them. Anyway, it, it's not everyone's business model, but it served me well and was actually pretty proficient. I didn't have to go track down my managers throughout the day to find out what they were doing. Well, guess what happened when I returned to work after the loss of my son? Right. No one stopped by my door anymore, did they? They were too uncomfortable, didn't want, didn't know what to say. Now, how much do you think that alone impacted productivity? The entire business model changed and it would take some time to smooth it back out, but it never came back to what it was. 
Regardless, it's going to take some time to change mindsets in business as well. Grief is just not something that's difficult to confront. Like coming to my door, grief is uncomfortable. Mortality is uncomfortable. When someone who is not going through grief doesn't have to think about it, they won't. It's not a good topic. That includes the upper echelon of businesses too. I approach business leaders all the time and tell them I'd like to discuss grief in the workplace with their management teams, help them handle the grieving employee. Almost always I get the immediate response, we don't need that, we already have an EAP. That's an employee assistance program. See, companies and organizations, if you don't know, contract out their mental health and substance abuse support for employees to an outside provider and they believe this is all that's needed for the bereaved employee. See, one thing these business owners and leaders don't take into account though, is that the EAPs are rarely used. A study by SHRM or the Society of Human Resource Management shows that only between three to 7% of eligible employees ever take advantage of an employee assistance program. And even if they do, the employee is limited in the number of times they can receive mental health assistance. Of course, they can continue on their own after the limits are up, but it's coming out of their pocket and out of the company pocket too if that employee decides to submit that with their healthcare provider. Listen, I'm not downing EAPs. I think they're fantastic and very much needed in the workplace, especially for the grieving employee if they would take advantage. But just having an EAP should not give our business leaders the confidence that they've done all they can for the bereaved worker. Enough on that for now. Companies will all come on board eventually. Grief impacts such a large majority of workers. As a matter of fact, for my category, employee with child loss, stats from the Center for Disease Controls or the CDC show that the majority of us are in the prime age of productivity when we lost our child. Grief hits us right when we were doing our best work. Makes sense when you think about it, but I never thought about it before. I never thought about it before the loss. I wish I'd never had a reason to think about it. Listen, our episode is coming to an end. If you'd like to find out more of those stats on grief impacts in the workplaces, as well as the programs I provide to these organizations, which is coaching both the management and the executives on interacting with grieving employees, go to my website, rglennkelly.com, and, and let me know what you think, either in the YouTube discussion area of BYOG or or just email me directly. There are also additional Grief in the Workplace episodes either posted or scheduled for the near future on BYOG, and not only for you, the grieving employee, but for the business owners and leaders as well. They have an incredible responsibility for the care and feeding of my fellow bereaved. Some may just not realize it yet. The big boys have no excuses though. The time has come to care for the bereaved employee. And listen, please watch or listen to my additional videos and podcasts on grief and bereavement support. Again, after the loss of a loved one, awareness and understanding of ourselves and of each other can go a long way to helping with the journey of healing. Also, I'd like to remind you, if you have not, please subscribe to the BYOG YouTube channel and like this video. You may be listening to this as a podcast through such programs as iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. If so, Afterwards, please visit the YouTube channel and subscribe. <laughs> Simply search for Arglin Kelly. And just FYI, the more subscribers to our channel and the more likes to the videos there, the easier it becomes for other grievers to find us in a search. For those interested in more information, I highly recommend any of my award-winning grief and bereavement support books. Sometimes I cry in the shower, a grieving father's journey to wholeness and healing or The Grief Case, A Man's Guide to Healing and Moving Forward in Grief, or Grief Healing 365, 365 Daily Inspirations for Moving Forward to Your New Normal. All are available in paperback and ebook at Amazon.com and Barnes and Noble, or in paperback at bookstores everywhere. If they don't carry them, kindly ask them to order them for you, any or all of them, and tell them to order extras because somebody else might be looking for them, right? And you'll also find trailers for these books on the BYOG YouTube channel. There's a link there if you want to. You can download free PDF samples of chapter one from each book. Enjoy and tell me what you think. If you have questions or comments about anything you find on BYOG, go to the channel homepage and start a discussion. 
I'll be there to answer or just chat. So that's it for now. Thank you for joining me here at the BYOG Network, the place where you can bring your own questions, bring your own pains, bring your own unique emotions, and bring your own grief. I am Arglin Kelly. May you find peace and purpose. <laughs>